Hello, I'm Tom Hathaway. I'm wearing my VA hat, so let's talk business analysis. We designed Writing Better Requirements in Plain English to give business analysts, systems analysts, product owners, product managers, subject matter experts, aka SMEs, and anyone wearing the BA hat, a set of three simple rules for writing better requirement statements for information technology projects. Regardless of your title or role, if you're involved in defining future business solutions, this course will greatly improve the communication between the business community and IT. This video course is the first in our series, How to Write Effective Requirements for IT Solutions. To maximize the learning effect, we designed it to be as interactive as possible, given the constraints of current technology. You'll have optional online exercises to assess your understanding of each presented technique. At the end of the course, a, quote, final exam, unquote, will allow you to test your understanding of how all of the presented ideas work together to make your requirements more easily understood by all respective target audiences. You can take notes while you view the content. Click the notes icon in the upper right corner of the window to show or hide your notes. Position your cursor on the blank note and start typing. You can write all your comments in one note box or add additional note boxes by clicking the plus sign. To delete a note, click the X symbol in the upper right hand corner of the note. You can also move your notes around by dragging the header bar. Click on the save or print icon to save your notes to your hard drive or print them. The primary learning objective of the workshop is to enable business people to communicate with the information technology department more effectively. As a side note, missing or misunderstood requirements are the chronic problem facing IT projects today and have been since the invention of this versatile and volatile technology. Therefore, we're going to introduce you to the idea of requirements based on the components of a business information system. In the world of requirements, ambiguity is one of your biggest enemies. You heard the words, but did you really get the meaning? Recognizing ambiguity is a key skill for those responsible for defining requirements. Assumptions are another major challenge to our communicative abilities. We'll discuss using a question file to reduce the impact of incorrect assumptions. As the title of the workshop suggests, will give you the ability to translate business needs and wants into requirements as the primary tool for defining a future solution and setting the testing stage. As soon as you mention requirements, the discussion around stating what, not how, seems to creep into the discussion. We'll give you a technique that helps you stay out of the technology early in the project. Scope creep is also a major challenge for those who use technology to change the business landscape, and avoiding it has become the holy grail for project managers everywhere. This workshop includes a couple of ideas that just might help here. At the end of the workshop, you'll be able to apply our three simple rules to create effective, i.e. focused, requirements for your IT solutions. Given these lofty, albeit achievable goals, and without further ado, or a did or a done or whatever, let's get started. First off, let's talk about the job that requirements have on a project. We'll start with the evolution of a typical business solution from the IT perspective. In the beginning, it all seems so simple. We think we know just what the customer wants, a bicycle, and we have a deadline, so let's get started. Well, as soon as we start to define the solution, we wonder whether the customer might need a little horsepower versus just person power on this device, so maybe we should give it a motor. Once we get into design, obviously safety becomes a concern, so let's put a cage around it. And of course, we'll need some doors to get in and out. There, isn't that much better already? Now developers love to try the latest and greatest technology, and to them, it's only reasonable that the customer might want to go off-road, like really, really fast. So why not give him the wings he deserves? Finally, since nobody told the testers what to test for, their first test is to try the thing outside the atmosphere, which it would fail if the developers did not quickly attach external fuel tanks. Now we're cooking with gas and ready to wow the customer with our whiz-bang solution, so... Oops! Looks like we did not really grasp the situation. Uh, so while we're at it, we need to explain to our customer why we're 5 million percent over budget and just a couple of centuries overdue. What is the real problem here? Comprehension and communication. 
or rather lack of both. Effectively captured and managed requirements could have avoided the entire mess. So what other good and great things would happen if we had effective, high-quality requirements? Well, for starters, we would expect to see a much better ROI, return on investment, for our development costs. Studies have shown that between a 2 to 1 and a 10 to 1 ROI is realistic on IT projects with the right parameters and effective requirements. Actually, good requirements also improve the business community's ability to realize new business opportunities because IT is less busy reacting to the problems that bad requirements in previous releases created. If we base the software on good requirements, the business could also react more quickly as the business environment changed. That would in turn reduce the levels of frustration and stress for everyone from the boardroom to the bathroom. If the requirements were doing their job, they would, as stated earlier, improve communication among the stakeholders and thereby reduce misunderstandings. Actually giving the business side priority over the technology side might sound like risky business from the IT perspective, but for the business community, this might actually right the ship and restore order to their world that has been lacking since we invented computers. Compared with all of the above mentioned benefits, the final three, earlier delivery, fewer unneeded features, and a lower defect rate, almost seem trivial. But trust me, these three alone would easily pay for the time spent up front many times over. Getting to these effective, high-quality requirements does, however, appear to be non-trivial, given that our industry has been struggling with this issue for decades. What is the problem here? Why is it so difficult? Well, what you as the individual responsible for defining requirements are fighting is a little thing called the uncertainty principle. If you happen to be knowledgeable about quantum physics, this may sound like old hat to you, but you may be surprised about our take on this. For normal people, i.e. us non-quantum physicists, this definition of the uncertainty principle might even be understandable. In the early days of any project, uncertainty may just be the only thing you have in abundance. The process of doing a project is actually one of reducing that uncertainty. Not to eliminate it, unfortunately, because that is impossible. There will always be some uncertainty. According to a German saying, theory is when you know everything and nothing works. Reality is where everything works and you don't know why. There will always be some uncertainty, some of which you are aware, and some you don't even know about. The real problem here is the pace at which the project reduces uncertainty. This green line here shows how we expect uncertainty to drop. As you see, it drops very rapidly at the beginning. That is what we call the analysis phase. And then, at some point, starts to level off. At that point, further analysis is useless, so it's time to start development. Obviously, uncertainty is now well contained, and if you try to reduce all uncertainty, you'll be in analysis paralysis very quickly. Unfortunately, in the real world, the uncertainty curve looks much more like the red line here. Note that at first, uncertainty does not drop, it increases. This represents what's happening at the beginning of the project when you thought you knew what the project would deliver. That is, until you started to do some analysis, only to realize that what little you thought you knew was not even right. Now you have to figure out who to ask, how to ask it, and what to believe of the answers, before you can really get down to the nitty-gritty of nailing the requirements. But wait, what's happening to our timeline here? Surely we can't hold off starting development until we get the answers we need to do it right. Sorry, but development can't wait. They have a deadline to meet. One of the oldest jokes in our industry is, you go ask the customer what he wants. We'll go ahead and start coding. Unfortunately, it seems to be as valid today as it was in the 60s when software was just coming of age. Nonetheless, instead of just complaining about the problems with defining requirements, we'd like to suggest a solution. We based our solution on a simple concept that says that all knowledge about the project falls into one of four basic categories. First off, there is what you know you know about the project, otherwise known as the facts. We realize that there are different levels of facts and differing degrees of certitude, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll stick with our original title. 
The next category represents what you know you do not know. Gosh, what do you call that? Well, we call it questions. This is based on the theory that if I can formulate a question, I am expressing something that I know I don't know. And guess what? If someone would give me an answer to my question, I would have, that's right, a new fact. Of course, that assumes that the answer was from whoever has the knowledge and the authority, either alone is not enough, to answer the question. That leaves us with the lower half of our box. First off, we have things that we do not know that we do know. Huh? How can you not know that you know something? Well, perhaps you did something in the past on other projects or in other lives that will help you on your current project. You just haven't identified them yet. We call that category experience. There's another category as well. That is something we call assumptions. Do you remember those questions we were just talking about? What happens if you can't find anyone who has the authority and the knowledge to give you the answer? Maybe because they're unavailable for your project, or maybe because nobody has ever tried to do what you're trying to do, at least within your organization. At some point, you need an answer for every open question, or someone somewhere will make an assumption and act upon it. That's life, and we're not saying there's anything wrong with it. We're simply pointing out that you need to get a better handle on it. If an assumption is necessary, make the most likely one and document it for posterity. Don't let it dangle or it will move quickly into the fourth dimension, which in our case is the final frontier. What you do not know that you do not know, or as some prefer to call it, the unknown unknowns. It's what we call fate. Fate exists on every project, even the best run. As we mentioned on the previous slide, there will always be things you don't know you don't know, so we have no choice but to live with it. It is, however, the number of factors that fall into this category that will ultimately determine the success or failure of your project. The challenge now has become, how can you manage what you know you know and keep track of what you know you don't know while using what you don't know you do know to combat what you don't know you don't know? If you can say that one three times without stuttering, you might be an analyst. Enter the question file. The question file is one of the simplest forms of documentation for a project, but it just may be the most important document you create. All it needs to contain is a list of what you know you don't know. Try to express the question in a manner that any answer you get becomes a new fact. I recommend dating each question so that you can keep track of when you realized on the project that you needed to know something and didn't. The who column is where you can jot down who within your organization you feel has the knowledge and the authority to answer the question, either by name or by role slash job title. This may change. It's not cast in concrete. You just think that this person would be your most likely target for getting an answer at this time. In the answer column, you can document whatever you get for an answer. Just in case you don't get an answer by the time you need it, you can also document your assumptions here. Just make sure that you document that this is an assumption. And by the way, I recommend telling the world, or at least anyone who you think maybe should have given you the answer, about your assumed answer. As a technique, you might consider a simple email that says, I needed to know this, and since we've not been able to get a definitive answer to date, we're going to work under the assumption that. The final date column is to document when I got the answer or made the assumption. Now, if you had a question file for your project, you could perform magic tricks. Just for example, you could sort your file on the answer column and count how many questions you had answered and how many were still open. The ratio of the two shows you where you are on the uncertainty curve we talked about earlier. You could also sort the file on the who column to determine who you should be interviewing next. Maybe the person for whom you have the most questions, hint, hint. If you browse this file and compared the date you identified the question with the date you got a response, it might even tell you something about the priority of the project from the perspective of the who column. Finally, if someone new comes onto the project, it could just be invaluable as a tool for getting them up to speed quickly and without you spending time telling them everything that's in the file. As I said, it's simply magic. Now, 
We've told you a lot about the problems and challenges that play good requirements gathering efforts, but that is just preaching. It's time for you to experience the challenge yourself. The English language, and any other language for that matter, is very subjective, meaning that the meaning of a word or phrase depends heavily on context. This subjectivity leads to problems on IT projects, but it can even be challenging in normal life. I have a little exercise to demonstrate my point. I'll read the text and then give you your instructions. Your assignment. A five-volume set of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire is sitting in proper order on a shelf. The 1,000 pages of each book are a total of four centimeters thick and each cover is 0.1 centimeter thick. If a bookworm begins eating at the first page of volume one and eats through to the last page of volume five, how many centimeters of paper has the worm eaten through? Now, I'd like you to answer the question, but to do that, you may need additional information. What do you need to know to complete this assignment? Type any questions you can think of in the text area provided. When you run out of questions, press the Submit button to see what awaits you. I'll catch up with you when you restart the presentation after this fun and enlightening little exercise.